Today, the NCAA had yet another day in court as the Supreme Court heard oral arguments for NCAA v. Alston. While this case on its face appears to deal with a very specific issue when it comes to the NCAA awarding payments to certain players, there are a lot of implications here that need to be discussed. The central issue at play is whether the NCAA as it stands will even be around in its current form for much longer. So let's talk about everything you need to know about NCAA v. Alston. So let's talk first about what this case is actually about, because as with most things that go to the Supreme Court, there is a lot of confusion and not a whole lot of ways to clear it up. So let me do my best. Essentially, what the NCAA is being sued for, they're being sued under under uh, antitrust law, specifically the Sherman Act. Uh, former West Virginia football player Sean Alston sued the NCAA, saying their rules on payments are too restrictive. So the NCAA, of course, allows, uh, they give scholarships, they give athletic scholarships, they give room and board, they give per diem for food during travel, uh, things like that, they give tutoring, everything that we know the NCAA does for its athletes. They've also recently allowed a $5,980 bonus for certain athletic achievements. And you might be thinking, that sounds very arbitrary, we'll get to that. Uh, but they still restrict athletes' abilities to secure paid internships or go to vo vocational schools, things like that. So when this went to a district court in California, originally the district court ruled partially in favor of Alston, saying that the NCAA was too restrictive when it came to academic awards, but they reaffirmed the NCAA's limitation on compensation not pertaining to athlete education, but there is still some significant issues here. The NCAA appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Ninth Circuit upheld, so now we are here at the Supreme Court. There are actually two issues at play here, and throughout the oral argument, you actually hear both issues being discussed almost simultaneously. It's really weird that certain justices question one issue and certain justices question the other, um, and one of them is actually much more important to what we care about as college as college sports fans. Uh, but so I'll walk you through the less interesting one, the procedural issue, and it centers around the the rule of reason approach to uh, to antitrust law. It's essentially when you talk about the rule of reason, it's essentially a way to examine antitrust issues under the Sherman Act that involves an extensive and rigorous, very painstaking review of several categories to determine whether a company is acting in an anti-competitive fashion. So for those of you that don't know, antitrust essentially uh, is out to prevent companies from holding monopolies that then, that then uh, hurt consumers. So it's it's very complex when you get into a lot of the litigation because, for example, you could say Amazon holds a monopoly on book sales, but does it hurt the consumers? Not really because books are now cheaper than they've ever been. That's just an example. That's what the Sherman Act deals with. And so the rule of reason is just a test to apply these different principles to, to actually figure out in practice if there is something anti-competitive going on. When you, when you perform this test, the burden actually rests on the defendants, in this case the NCAA. They have to prove that they are taking pro-competitive measures to make sure that, that uh, consumers are still getting the best products possible. So that was a procedural claim, and that the only reason I say that is because when we get to the end about what the ultimate conclusion of this might be, that procedural issue will actually become pretty important. But what I wanna get down to right now is the real issue at play. And the real issue is not just whether athletes can actually be paid, uh, the issue is about the nature of amateurism in college sports. So let me give you a little bit of background. The NCAA's lawyer was essentially arguing the whole time that the NCAA must be able to restrict competition among its member schools. It must be able to control its labor market because that's what differentiates the NCAA from any other sports league. That is what is so important about it. And ultimately, Justice Elena Kagan got to this question, tried to drill down to the bedrock of this question. So she, so she asked the NCAA, if we view the NCAA as the market, 
then why shouldn't we view all the other, the individual schools, the member schools under the NCAA's banner as essentially getting together and fixing the price of labor so that no competition can enter the market? We call this a monopsony, meaning that one company has control over the entire labor market. And in the, in the NCAA's case, that's essentially what Justice Kagan asked. She said, is that the case? She says there will be, she essentially says there will be co cooperation between member schools and conferences in terms of figuring out the rules of the game. So you don't want the SEC playing football with 11 players and the ACC decides we're actually going to play it with seven players. Um, but she asks, that is separate. Why does there, why does that cooperation need to also be in place when it comes to the cost of labor? And this answer from the NCAA gets right down, I think, to to the the actual core of everything that these arguments are about when we talk about should the NCAA be, pay, be paying players and everything else. The NCAA's lawyer essentially says the cost of labor, in this case, zero dollars, no salary, is the differentiating feature between the NCAA, between college sports and professional leagues. That, in other words, the NCAA must, must be allowed to not pay its athletes because that is the reason that people watch college sports and not professional sports. That's why you would turn on during college football season, you turn on college football on Saturday and you don't turn on baseball. That's the, that is the reason that, that the NCAA is arguing. So Justice Kagan actually presses on this. So she's saying if consumers really cared that the cost of labor was so low in the NCAA versus professional leagues, then that would actually be a valid argument. However, there was actually a lot of uh, research done at the district court level when they were arguing this, experts brought in, uh, that found consumers, and this is a quote from Justice Kagan, don't really care about the cost of labor on the basis of survey evidence. So Alston lawyers essentially proved that raising athletes' salaries to, let's say, $10,000, uh, or even more than that, would not affect demand for the product, and that NCAA experts could not actually disprove that. So the evidence, according to Justice Kagan, actually suggests the exact opposite of what the NCAA is arguing, that, that its restriction on the labor market for for college sports actually is not the differentiating factor. Um, and later on, when when Alston's lawyers were arguing, that issue came came back up, and and actually, uh, an issue presented to Alston's lawyers was that what if the NCAA where would where would that number stop? Because right now it's that five thousand nine hundred and eighty dollar number that the NCAA has specified. What if it was 10,000? What if it was 20,000? And a significant issue that several justices had with Alston's side was that how are we going to avoid this exact issue continuing to come back up in court as athletes continue to argue for more and more and more payments if if the court were to side with Alston in this particular issue. Um, now, the NCAA's response to this, I thought was was very interesting. This is from the lawyer. He says, essentially 10% of respondents to these surveys said that they'd actually be less interested in college sports if athletes were awarded $10,000 a year. So I'm going to read you a direct quote here from the NCAA's lawyer. Quote, pro-competitive differentiation is not necessarily measured by net consumer demand. The independent value of preserving consumer choice is not the value of maximizing consumer interest. Otherwise, you wouldn't have specialized products. Now, that sounds like a lot of legal gobbledygook, but let me explain essentially what he's saying. Pro-competitive differentiation, meaning that the NCAA is different than professional leagues, is not necessarily measured by net consumer demand, meaning if we were to raise athletes' salaries, the change or lack thereof in demand for college sports does not would not actually measure how different the NCAA is from professional leagues. The independent value of preserving of preserving consumer choice, meaning how important it is that consumers get a choice of what to watch, is not the value of maximizing consumer interest, meaning that meaning that the value of consumers choosing what we want to watch is not the same as maximizing consumer interest.
So what he's essentially saying is that 10% of people who would be less interested in college sports if athletes made $10,000 a year, that is much, much more important than the 90% of people who wouldn't care. Because according to him, without this, you wouldn't have specialized products. He is essentially defining college sports as a specialized product. And therefore, we must have athletes that are not paid. If you take that away, you won't get that anymore. You won't get that specialized product. Now, later on in the questioning, Justice Kavanaugh actually ended up calling him out. He, he essentially said that this logic for the NCAA, that they shouldn't have to pay athletes because the sole differentiating factor is consumers don't want them to pay athletes, that is circular logic. And he's absolutely right. When, when you look at it from, from a certain perspective, what the NCAA is saying, we don't pay athletes because people watch us because we don't pay athletes, so therefore we don't pay athletes. But what Justice Kagan and Justice Kavanaugh and also Justice Gorsuch, what they kept asking was, Clearly, based on survey evidence, people don't care whether you paid athletes or not. So therefore, that's not your sole differentiating factor. And to, in, to interject my own opinion here, I actually sort of agree to a point. I think that if you were to pay athletes $10,000, it wouldn't matter to me at all because the reason I watch college sports is not because they're not paid. It's because I love the school that I watch. I have a, I have a connection to the school that I watch. Um, now, there is actually a limit on this, and I'll get to that in one second. But I want to get to one last thing the NCAA lawyer said in response to Justice Kavanaugh, who called out that circular logic. He says the amateurism model should be taken up by legislatures as it's not an antitrust issue. So using the rule of reason approach that I mentioned earlier to antitrust law, because the control of the labor market is the sole determining and most important factor in our differentiating product, meaning what he's saying is the NCAA is and must be a monopsony. And so therefore, therefore, this satisfies the rule of reason test that I was talking about earlier. Even if consumers were just as happy if athletes were paid, that doesn't, and I'm quoting again the NCAA's lawyer, quote, defeat the pro-competitive effect we provide. So essentially, what he's saying is that all of this that we're talking about is not actually an antitrust issue. What we are talking about should go to the legislatures to figure out. The only important thing we have to deal with here is, is the NCAA being anti-competitive when it comes to its rules? And he's saying, we're not. Because the NCAA must be a monopsony. If you were to make us not a monopsony, that would actually be anti-competitive. That's essentially what he's saying in, in so many words. Now, this all just sounds like so much. It, it sounds like so much kind of highbrow thinking and so much legalese and and all all these kinds of you know things that if you didn't go to law school, which I didn't, you know, how the hell would you actually understand any of this or really care, uh, really care about this at all? But Here's why, here's why it's important. Actually, before I get to that, I want to I want to talk quickly about the questioning of Alston's side. Uh, there was much less here that I think was was really interesting. It tended to revolve more around the procedural, the rule of reason test that I was talking about, uh, but also the justices. What I thought was very interesting was they have a fervent desire to maintain college sports. The justices seem to be very, 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 very reticent about touching anything that has to do with the amateurism model. Uh, but a lot of the justices are fans of college sports, um, and I think that they were they were concerned about potentially destroying the way college sports functions because of a decision that ends up being too broad. Um, they were concerned about essentially the destruction of college sports as we know it. So here's what I think. In the end, this case, my guess, uh, it will most likely not create any kind of seismic shift in the nature of college sports because as I said, the court is very, very hesitant to make 
any decision surrounding this issue for fear of legislation, what we call legislation from the bench, ruining college sports. So essentially meaning they're afraid that their decision would be used to essentially create new legislation for the NCAA that would destroy college sports as we know it. So my guess is when the NCAA addresses this case, they are going to deal with this rule of reason issue and whether or not they can take a quick look review of it rather than tackle the issues that were brought up by Justices Kagan, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh. Um, however, they did leave the door open to allowing legislation that could significantly change the nature of college sports. Uh, and it felt like the NCAA itself was actually deflecting issues away for the legislature to deal with later. So essentially, the NCAA was basically saying, right now consider the procedural issue and if the house of representatives comes up with a bill if the senate you know uh, adopts a bill and the president signs it into law we'll challenge it at that time so the nca was basically begging state or federal legislatures to deal with this issue rather than let the supreme court do it and it seemed like the supreme court was uh, pretty willing to go along with that um Listening to the oral arguments, I kind of got the feeling that the court will rule in favor of Alston on this case. Uh, the more conservative justices, uh, so that's Justice Thomas, Justice Kavanaugh, um, Justice Gorsuch, and uh, and Justice Alito, um, they are worried about competition in the marketplace, and the more liberal justices are concerned about the procedural issue that we were talking about. And of course, we talked about uh, Justice Kagan as well, trying to drill down to the bedrock of this issue about how it would be unfair to not pay athletes, given what the NCAA has, has already argued. However, the bigger question of what comes next for the NCAA still looms large in the distance. It seems that the court will do everything in their power to make sure that this decision in this case is as limited as possible to avoid the destruction of the amateurism model, which as I said, the court is very, very hesitant to, to even touch, and the NCAA knows that. However, there are some really big questions moving forward for the NCAA, and this is why this case is so important, even if the decision itself may only result in athletes being given you know a few more dollars so essentially if the court were to affirm the ninth circuit court of appeals or send it back for the uh, for the district court's decision essentially what it would what it would mean is that schools would be allowed to pay that five thousand nine hundred and eighty dollar number to its athletes for anything they could say if you maintain a 3.0 grade point average then you'll get this bonus uh, that was an example that was brought up by the by the uh, Alston's lawyer. Um, and so if you are an athlete that's looking at this and saying, man, another six thousand dollars, I mean, that would be huge. Then then this would be a great decision for you. Um, and it again, this is my opinion just from listening to the oral arguments. I'm not a lawyer, um, but from my research, it certainly seems like the court may very well be leaning towards that. Um, so you know uh get your studies done and you may be entitled to a bonus depending on where you are and alston argued that uh essentially the conferences would be able to set policy regarding that particular payment but the bigger issue here when it comes to the nature of college sports the nature of the amateurism model is one is the ncaa's monopsony power truly the differentiating factor in the sports marketplace as i mentioned before the ncaa argued that its monopsony is the very difference between the ncaa and say the nfl the nfl does not have monopsony power at least in theory the ncaa does the, the, the reason the NFL doesn't have monopsony power, by the way, is because different teams can offer different contracts. Um, so, for example, the NFL as a whole has control over the football labor market because obviously you would go to the NFL rather than to the Canadian Football League. But the Kansas City Chiefs would offer a different contract to a player than the Denver Broncos would, for example. The NCAA does not allow that. The NCAA, as a nationwide organization, enforces one rule that all of its member schools must follow. But after the questioning from Justice Kagan and followed up by Justice Kavanaugh, does that is that going to be the case going forward? That is a serious question, and if it's not, then this entire argument for the NCAA basically falls apart. And playing off of that, 
wooden athletes now be entitled to collect payment for their name, image, and likenesses if future litigation would prompt courts to subject them, the NCAA, to the rule of reason test, which the NCAA would surely violate, which is why I brought up that procedural claim at first, because even if the courts are very specific, or the court rather, is very specific about how they about how they uh, make this decision, what it still would mean is that it would subject the NCAA to this rule of reason test, which would mean that if they were brought back into court, then that then they would be them being subject to this test would mean that athletes would have the upper hand if they were to argue that they should be able to collect money off of their name, image, and likeness. And because the NCAA basically punted to the legislate to the legislatures about so many of these rules, then for example, a bill like what we saw in California, that their name, image, and likeness bill, which we discussed in a video last year when it passed, the NCAA would not be allowed to kick California schools out of its competition because they just said that they would have to respect what the legislature does. So the California legislature pa passes that bill and several other state legislatures seem like they may follow. The NCAA wouldn't be allowed to take punitive action against those, those states. And the third question, will the NCAA be able to do anything if a state or federal or federal legislation passes a, a bill or a law about any of its practices specifically related to those name, image, and likeness? This case makes me think that no, they wouldn't be able to do anything about that. And so that is where we could actually see college sports significantly changing, not because specifically of the decision that may get handed down in this case, which should be coming uh, before the summer, so in the next three or four months, but the long-ranging effects that could come from this decision could actually mean a whole lot to the way the NCAA decides that it wants to do business. But because of this, there are actually questions that we need to think about now. Questions that we need to ask ourselves as fans of college sports. We have to ask if something like this that we're seeing right now would destroy any semblance of parity in college sports. This was actually an issue brought up during the oral arguments, and I believe the NCAA, uh, their lawyers had to, had to answer for this, uh, because essentially the question was asked if conferences, if certain conferences, this was Justice Alito asking, um, talking about, for example, coaches. Coaches are paid so much. I believe in 34 states, uh, coaches are recognized as the highest paid uh, state employees. Athletes aren't given anything. They're not paid anything. And they do have a very tough life in the course of playing their sports and and their academics and everything everything that goes along with being a collegiate athlete. And so he essentially says the issue is not whether they will be paid. They're already paid in the form of lower admission standards, scholarship, room and board, things like that. The question is how much are they being paid and in what form? And so that goes to this idea that if, let's say, the NCAA or, or rather the SEC basically says, we're going to allow our schools to pay their players as much as they want to, then Alabama, whose football program makes millions and millions and millions of dollars, they could pay their recruits any number under the sun and a school in the A10 wouldn't or the Mac they there's no way they'd be able to equal that so you just widen that disparity in terms of parity in the NCAA right now and then that would lead to this issue that we've actually discussed in the past it's been discussed many times what if the power 5 conferences broke away from the NCAA? What if they formed their own group and the rest of the group of five and all the other mid-major conferences, they were just left out in the dust? What would happen then? We're watching the NCAA tournament go on right now and Houston, one of the four schools in the final four, both Houston and Gonzaga, do not come from major conferences. So what happens if the Pac-12, the Big 10, the Big 12, the SEC and the ACC just decide we're going into business for ourselves. Our schools are going to be allowed to pay their athletes. And so a school like Gonzaga, who has a very, very rich tradition in basketball, there's no possible way that they could compete. There's no possible way they could keep up if they're not allowed to pursue those same standards. And if they were, then Gonzaga would just widen the gap between them and every other school in the West Coast Conference because Gonzaga makes so much money from their basketball program, but the University of San Francisco doesn't. You see what I mean? 
if we were to start paying college athletes, we would open up an entirely new can of worms about are we actually going to destroy competition in the NCAA? And that's what the Supreme Court justices were so worried about doing throughout the course of this oral argument. And so then I ask you, would you as a college sports fan really get the same enjoyment out of college sports if athletes were paid these hefty salaries the way that professional athletes are paid these hefty salaries? Professionals, it's in the name. They're professionals. They get paid. We know that. But college sports, there is an allure to the amateurism model in college sports. There is a reason that people that people identify with college sports that, you know, the University of Montana can sell out a 50,000 seat stadium, but a professional team in Montana probably couldn't. Right. There's a reason for that. And if if we were to take this to its logical conclusion, would that reason disappear? That is the question that the court now has to contend with. And that's going to be the question in the future. This specific case is going to deal with a very specific uh, outcome for certain athletes. And if you are an athlete that's going to receive this this uh, almost $6,000 payment, then that's fantastic. But the athletes 10 years down the road, if, if it's possible for them to receive a $50,000 payment to go to Alabama, well, you know, would that not destroy what we love about college sports? And that's that's a real question. I'm turning it over to you. Let us know in the comments if you think it would destroy college sports. Um, would you be okay with with Alabama and USC and Nebraska and schools like this being able to pay their athletes six figure or even seven figure salaries to come play for them? Or would that destroy your enjoyment of college sports? Let us know in the comments. And we have another video covering the oral arguments here. We've got, there's a lot of other things that were mentioned. Uh, things talking about Title IX, uh, talking about more specifically about the future of college sports and talking about whether the NCAA, for example, would be would be uh, uh, subject to antitrust lawsuits in the future. There's a lot of little things that I want to talk about, so we'll have a video coming up within the next week talking about some of the more little things that could end up being important. So make sure you subscribe so you can see that. And again, let us know in the comments what you thought of all of this. Go check out the links to articles that you might find helpful and to the oral argument itself. Those are all down in the description as well. Thank you so much. We appreciate you.